Now that we know how synthesis basically works, we can go revisit how we write Verilog for synthesis. So there are some things that we may have missed. We now see how synthesis works, so let's revisit some of the things we may have skipped or briefly mentioned earlier. For example, let's take a 4 to 2 encoder. Remember that what an encoder does, it takes a one hot encoded vector and outputs the position of the one bit in binary encoding. Okay, so one way we could possibly write this, and I'm just going to show you how different ways of writing our Verilog could affect things. Okay, so we can write always at x, begin, encode, that's just the name of the block. If x equals 0, 0, 0, 1, then we'll output 0 for the 0 position of the 1. If it equals 0, 0, 1, 0, we'll put out, output the 1 position, 1, 0, 0, the, the 2 position, and 1, 0, 0, 0 will put out the 3 position. Uh, if not, we'll propagate an x. Okay, so what happens when we actually synthesize this? The um, synthesizer has to adhere to what we wrote here. And we see that there's precedence. It has to check this condition before it checks all the rest. That causes what we call priority logic. As you see here, we have to check this 0, 0, 0, 1. Uh, going into a multiplexer, and we have to check that before we check uh, 1, 0, 0, 0. And it, it makes the synthesizer put this type of a structure out, and the reason is that that's what we told it to do. It has to check all this uh, in a sequential fashion, so this has to happen before this. And that causes this thing called priority logic. That may be something we wanted to do, but often it was by accident. If we had Use the case construct, for example, we have always at x, right, case x, and then we have all these options. Cases are usually parallel. You can also tell the uh, synthesizer in various ways, such as pragmas or in um, certain options inside the synthesis tool to, um, to uh, relate to this as in parallel, but usually they're taken in parallel. So if we did that, all of these things are equal and in parallel, and we get this type of a logic if we um, go and, uh, and implement what it says. Now, is that good or not good? Well, the synthesizer can look at this and see that it can actually really, really cut down on the logic and optimize it to be just a uh, type of a NAND gate and an OR gate. And that's much smaller than the logic we had in the priority logic, um, uh, achieving the same thing. We could have also written it a bit differently. For example, um, Let's say uh, what would happen if we could guarantee that the input was one hot encoded. We know it's one hot encoded because, um, say, our logic wouldn't allow it to be something else. Then we could just write the, um, the, the code differently. We could write just looking at the single bit, if x0 or if x1 or if x2 or if x3, and that could bring out different type of logic. Again, this is priority logic because we're looking at x0 before the rest, and we get what we call a priority decoder. Okay, you see that um, we have we, we look at x0, but we don't look at the whole uh, vector of, uh, of, uh, of x. We can look at one bit and we get much smaller logic, and um, we get the, the, this bit gets signif significance over the others. So that's something we might want to do. Okay, let's look at the operators that we used in Verilog. Um, remember that logical operators map into primitive gates. So if you use an OR, like we do in assign A or B, it'll just turn into an OR gate, and that's very nice. But arithmetic operators, they map into different things. Adders, subtractors, these things are big. Um, they can be uh, unsigned two's complement. They uh, uh, have to take into account carries. Right, And then if you write something like a multiplier, then it's going to be a big multiplier. So it's not that trivial, and it's much better to do it if you can stay away from it with all kinds of shifters and things. Um, and if you write modulo or divide, that's going to be a bigger problem because modulo and divide um, are really non-trivial types of, uh, of implementations. Okay, relational operators, bigger than, smaller than, etc., et they make comparators. Comparators, again, these are a type of like an adder or subtractor, and so they're going to be big. Now, shifting. Shifting is interesting because if we shift by a constant amount, look, this is a shifter that shifts by 2. All it does is it makes a connection between the input bit and the output bit, and that does the shift. That's because it's by a constant value. So this is very cheap logic. But if we have... A variable amount of a shifter we need a shifting uh, module and that's another big arithmetic block so if you can turn it into a, um, a constant shifter please do 
Okay, um, conditional expressions like an if uh, or a case, they obviously make uh, uh, logic such as multiplexers. Data paths are very interesting and important. So adders and multipliers and so forth, as we said, they're complex. They have uh, a lot of meaning. And um, we, you probably learned in a previous course that there are different ways to do this. For example, a multiplier. It could be made with a Wallace tree multiplier. It could do booth recoding. It could use a carry save, uh, a carry save adder array. There are lots of ways to do this. And um, in most of the tools nowadays, what happens is, is that you get these IPs, these pre-written um, kind of structural uh, descriptions of how to make these different types of architectures and the synthesizer will either choose one of them for you according to the different constraints that you enter into it or you can actually explicitly tell it to use one type or another. Um, these in synopsis are called designware. They're kind of the father of these types of IPs that um, they're, they're soft IPs that you can use to implement. Cadence calls theirs chipware. So these are types of things that you should use, you should be uh, aware of. You can look into the user manuals of designware or chipware or whatever other companies provide and uh, see how to instantiate them, see how to use them, and see what actually the synthesizer decided to use in implementing these things. A, a very important point, and I decided to put it here, is clock gating. So the clock is continuously toggling. It has a very high activity factor, um, and so it's a major consumer of dynamic power. Therefore, in order to save power, we will try to turn off the clock, ga uh, clock for gates that are not in use, and that's called clock gating. So we have two ways of doing basically clock gating. If we know that a whole module is not working, we can do what is called block level or global clock gating. Okay, so we can just put a clock gate in that we uh, instantiated or put it in our RTL and we can decide that we don't need to use if, if uh, a certain mode wants to turn off a certain block we just gate the clock it will never be used the clock won't get into the block and nothing will actually change in the state and, um, and our clock tree also won't be uh, wasting power that's one level it's a very coarse level there's another level that's local clock gating or register level clock gating we can see in a, in a second how we can um, implement for each and every register, we can check if we can put a clock gate in certain conditions. So what are those conditions? Well, if we have an enable, uh, an enable condition. So for example, here we have a D flip-flop. And what happens is um, we have some sort of enable condition um, that says that if enable is 1, then we should take D in and propagate it to D out. But if enable is 0, what we should do is just resample our original signal. That's just like an enable flip-flop. Okay, if we take this thing and instead remove this multiplexer here and replace it with some sort of a clock gate, for example, an AND gate, we can stick the enable into the AND gate and the clock will only propagate to, uh, to the pin here once enable is uh, 1. So therefore, we saved the toggling on the clock net. This will save power actually inside the flop. And we'll see in a moment we can share this between different flip-flops. So that's how we do local clock gating. There are three methods, in fact, to do local clock gating. On the one hand, we can use the logic synthesizer to find and implement local cl uh, clock gating opportunities. So if we just write a flip-flop, always at pause edge clock, if enable q equals d in, then um, what can happen is the synthesizer can run over this code and see, aha, I see one of those uh, examples like we saw a minute ago, an enable flop. I can remove the enable and instead use a clock gate. Remember, this is not Boolean equivalent, but it has the same functionality. Uh, a different way is to do it with RTL code, where we can explicitly specify clock gating. So we can assign gated clock equals enable and clock, and then always at pause edge gated clock. So we only propagate the gated clock into a flip-flop that doesn't have enable in it. A third way is to, um, uh, that, uh, to explicitly instantiate a, um, a clock gate in the RTL. So we have this uh, uh, module called clock uh, CLKGX1. We can instantiate it, give it an enable signal, a clock, and the out of it is a gated clock, and put that in the flip-flop. So that's a, a another way to do it. Um, we can also do some of these at the global uh, method. One is using this RTL code, and the other one is instantiating a clock gate. Often we'll use the instantiation actually of a clock gate because that way uh, it's easy to tell the synthesizer not to remove it and to keep it there even though it may not look like it has any, um, any reason to be there for some sort of uh, a synthesis algorithm. But 
maybe I was lying to you because what happens if there's a glitch on the enable signal? Look, we have this uh, AND gate here. Glitches on AND gates can propagate. So, so let's look at what happens here. And we have our clock signal. We have our enable signal. And let's see what happens with our gated clock. So um, the clock went down here and there was a glitch on the enable signal. And lo and behold, nothing happened to the gated clock signal, so we were fine. And as I say here, we live in a perfect world. We get a little smiley face, and it's even green. However, not so fast, my friends. What happens if the glitch happened during the high phase of the clock? And that's where a real um, sorrow happens. Because if the glitch happened here, what happens is this AND gate propagates the, uh, the signal to the output, and we get a fake clock edge on, on the flip-flop, and that's really bad. In fact, it's so bad that we can't actually use such a structure. So what do we do? Luckily, a um, long time ago, our forefathers found something called a glitch-free clock gate. And it's basically taking a latch here with a negative edge latch, a negative level latch, and connecting it to the clock signal. Um, and the enable goes through that before connecting to uh, this the same AND gate we had before. Um, we can also describe it here in RTL. However, this is usually what we call an integrated clock gate, and it's provided in our standard cell library. So let's see what happens with this. We have our same clock, and just to see that we're not doing anything during the low edge of the clock phase, enable changes during the low edge of the clock phase. And what we see here is that enable out this signal over here. Um, it basically follows whatever happened at D, right? Because this is a negative latch when a uh, clock is low then this latch is transparent and enable out goes low. Did it cause some sort of glitch on gated clock? No, because clock was low and therefore through an AND gate gated clock was low. So any change on enable out didn't actually um, do anything to us, which is the same as just putting an AND gate over here. So it was fine that we propagated our um, enable out signal during the low phase of the clock. So what happens if we have our glitch on the high phase of the clock over here. Well, at that time, our latch is actually opaque, and then um, the D will not be traversed, will not be passed over to the enable out. Enable out will stay stable at zero, and our gated clock signal will stay stable at zero. So this solves our problem, and this is the type of a clock gate either using an integrated single standard cell or um, by writing our RTL in this way, we get this type of a structure. Um, we can merge clock enable gates. As you saw, putting a latch and uh, AND gate is kind of expensive. Latches are big. So what we can do is we can find all kinds of places where the same enable signal goes to multiple flops. If the same enable signal is going to multiple flops, then we can just use one clock gating cell providing the gated clock and then pass all those uh, that uh, gated clock to all these flops and then the um, extra area of this latch or this integrated clock gating cell is divided among all those flops, and that's usually what's done. We can usually tell the synthesis tool um, how what our threshold is of how many flip-flops that have to share an enable signal in order to use this clock gating, or else it's too expensive to do. Another type of gating is data gating. Um, clock gating is very well understood and automated. But there's another thing that happens on data signals that we can also sometimes save uh, power. There are different heuristics and algorithms to look for data gating, but uh, it's not as trivial and straightforward as clock gating. And we should write our RTL um, with this in knowledge to try and keep our power low. So for example, uh, here's a kind of a simple example about this type of a thing. We have some sort of an ALU and it has a shifter and an adder inside. And we have this uh, signal called shift add select, which selects either to output the shifter output or the adder output uh, to the next uh, level on. Um, we also know from our um, block that we barely ever use the shifter. We're usually using the adder. The problem is that every time that A and B change, we calculate this addition, which wastes power in the adder, and we calculate the shift, which wastes power in the shifter. And usually we're not using the shifter, so that's kind of ridiculous to do. So instead of that, what we could do, what we could do is put a data gating uh, AND gate on the entrance to the shifter, and then as long as this select is selecting the adder, um, the inputs to the shifter will be zero, and we won't waste any power uh, on uh, changes due to A and B changes on the shifter. So that's the type of a thing that we could do. 
A uh, point about that is what's called a linter. So um, there's a linting tool or a linter. I'm not sure exactly where the word lint comes from. Maybe it's for cleaning up lint like in your laundry. But it uh, is something to find all kinds of problems with how you wrote your code. It finds things that could cause problems in simulation and synthesis, uh, mis things that could cause mismatches between simulation and uh, synthesis, places where you could uh, put a clock gate, um, places that will cause latches to be inferred, um, clock domain crossing issues, and all kinds of strange uh, assignments and uh, bit width and stuff like that. Actually, these type of uh, lint tools, they usually uh, output lots and lots and lots of warnings and um, a designer will have to go through them and kind of try to clean out their log files because many of the things were done um, purposely but sometimes it can pick up some really bad problems um, note that it's not for checking syntax your simulator will already check syntax if you're missing a semicolon or something um, but uh, uh, i just want to mention that some of the synthesis tools maybe even some of the simulation tools will already give you basic lint warnings um, such as uh, is done in genus with uh, uh, with uh, some of the Cheka design tools.